Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me tell you about the only supplements that I use. For nearly 10 years, Bear Performance Nutrition has been on a mission to educate, inspire, and improve the performance of modern day athletes, adventurers, and warriors through training, nutrition, and supplementation. With effective formulas that work as hard as you do and are third party tested for prohibited substances, you can get results and reach your full potential with Bear Performance Nutrition. Head to the link in the show notes to go to the website to help me out and to help you out so that we can go one more together. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 61. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very special guest out in the great state of Minnesota, Zach Donahue. Zach, what's going on? Hey, Joe. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. This is this going to be good. So excited. Of course, man. I was thinking of how to introduce you. Uh, I've been thinking all today of how to introduce you. And the words that kept coming to mind were intentional, thoughtful, driven, caring, loving, and a few others. Um, I don't want to hype you up too much because I want you to be able to do that for yourself. So why don't you uh, explain to the audience a little bit who you are? Yeah, so I'm Zach Donahue. I am a officially a retired rugby player. So I played throughout high school, throughout college, played after college somehow. Um, that's a different story entirely. But um, through rugby, through sport, I spent a lot of time around just like different groups of people learning a lot about myself. But like one of the biggest thing that came up was this this pursuit of just doing a little bit more and being intentional with that and being just like connect to the people that you're a part of. Um, I, a lot of different teams I was part of, we always used the word family, you know, we're a family, but very few times was I actually part of a team where they actually meant that. So I got really connected to the communities, the players I was playing with and like building that relationship. And so like relationships, teams, like community building, stuff like that is like such a core part of my identity and like who I want to be and like the world I want to create. So post playing days, post law school days, I'm in the process of Eventually, at some point in time, I will quit my full-time job to be able to be a full-time mental skills coach for youth athletes, uh, specifically high school and then college as well, just helping them reframe their mental capacity to be able to perform better on the field and then off the field as well. And just bring that all together and then embedded behind that all is this mental health focus of, you know, bringing an awareness to our mental health, bringing a different way to have a conversation on it and be proactive about it rather than reactionary which is what you see a lot, you know, go to therapy. Yeah. Go to therapy. It's great. But also understanding that like there are things we can do before we get to therapy to like help build those skills, build that resiliency so that when hard things do come up, um, we, we can do them. And that that's what we want to be able to do. Um, I love it. You know, for people listening, Zach and I get to talk every Wednesday morning. It's uh, it's the best part of my week. It's one of the best parts of my week. And we often have these conversations that I just wish were recorded so that other people could listen in. And we usually start by talking about the the mental skills that Zach alluded to. And we usually end up talking a lot about life. And so it goes from sport to life, life to sport, back and forth. And there's so many parallels. I'm just curious for you, Zach, having played sport at a high level, what are maybe one or two of the biggest lessons from sport that transition over to life for you? Um, I mean, I think sports one, like, especially like not at the low levels, but like in high school, like sports is a great place to learn about life. It's a place to fail without there being like real consequences. If you, you know, you're playing football in high school and you don't win a state championship, who cares? You can say you worked really hard. You got there, you learned, you know, lessons of resiliency, hard work, determination, all those other things. And then you can use that to go forward as, you know, a CEO, as a company down the road, as a entrepreneur, as something else it may be because you have that foundational piece to build off of it. And you can use that as a stepping stone. It's like, Hey, I was able to do this stuff when I was younger. I can use that 
and put it together in a package and then move forward with it with that next thing. So I think like that hard work determination, but being very focused with your goal setting. I think that's the big thing I learned at like once I got playing at a higher level in college at the division one men's club level is just like being super intentional with that goal setting, but like, what do I bring to the table? So recognizing your own skill set, your own limitations and not being upset that like, I didn't have the best size. I'm five foot six, 170 pounds. I, I don't have size, but I made up with it with, for the fact that like I was an intelligent player and I knew how to play my role. So like, I wasn't going beyond my limits. And if I went beyond my limits, I knew where I needed to be. So I wasn't hurting my team. So I could help, you know, pull those people up. You know, like those are those leadership things we talk about all the time. It's like, if you're that leader, if you're that captain on the team, you got to be leading from the front and setting the example of what it means to take on a big hit, take on a, take on a run, do whatever it needs, empower a newer player, empower somebody on your team so that they feel comfortable in that environment. So they want to keep coming back. And like, then that comes back to the community team building stuff that I, I'm huge about is this the fact that if you make people feel welcome and warm in a space, they're more likely to come back to it, regardless of the fact if they're good at the thing or not, because they want to be part of that space. You know, we also have talked quite a bit about leadership and how the best players often aren't the best leaders. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I know a lot of people listening to this podcast might be past the world of formal sport, but I think this also applies to, you know, the boardroom, um, yeah. the classroom. It applies everywhere in life. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer of the fact that like, you don't want your best player to be your captain. They might, they might be on that leadership committee and stuff like that, which is a whole different thing, but like, you don't want that best player to be your, your captain, that on face guy, because you want, they let them just be the elite player, let them play at the high level, let them do the thing, understanding all of that, but also like understand that there are other leaders in that locker room. Maybe it's a defensive specialist, somebody like you know normal people fans on the outside may not notice it maybe it's the left guard on the on the green bay packers i don't know whoever it may be it's a guy that's able to step up and like when you speak up and when they say something it's everyone in the room gets quiet because if, if this person's saying something it means that it matters to them which means it matters to the team and i noticed this a lot in just my high school playing days is i had a really good team around me but i was also one of our leaders I wasn't, I wouldn't speak a lot in practice. I wouldn't speak a lot in games. I just kind of just did my thing, but there were a couple of games. It's like, we need to be playing better. These are the things I'm noticing. Like if I said something, one of our other teammates, usually, you know, better players like, Hey, shut up. Zach is speaking. He has something to say. We listen to this because this is going to get everybody on the same page. And I think understanding that dynamic of leadership of it's like, yeah, sometimes you don't need to be the superstar. If you understand your role, you know what you bring to the table and people respect you because of, you know, maybe it's the stuff you do in practice. It's that hard work. It's, you know, you helping another player after practice get better because they want to get better. That's your job as a leader to take the time and explain those skills that they might not have had the time to learn throughout practice. Like, yeah, that, that's your job there. The coach's job is to be able to put you in positions to be successful, but you as a captain, a leader, whatever phrase you want to use, you have to help the players get there too. You can't just show up on game day and expect everybody to follow you if you're doing nothing to allow them to want to follow you. Yeah. And it applies to everywhere in life and just goes to uh, hopefully encourage people that, right? Even if you're not the most knowledgeable person in the room, even if you're not the top producer for your work, right? You can be a leader from anywhere at any time. Uh, and I think all leadership involves and requires making other people better. Um, so that's that's definitely a good point. Now, Zach, I'm going to throw you all over the place here before we dive into the deep stuff, because uh, I really enjoy picking your brain and, and having conversation on a regular basis. But two episodes ago with Alex Zahner, who you introduced me to, I'm very grateful for that. I mentioned something you said to me, and I want to hear you expand on it here. You said, you actually asked me, when did you stop dancing in the rain? Or when did you stop playing in the rain? And yes. I thought that was such a good question. So tell me more about it. Yeah. So that comes from a, this actually came from an idea I had while this was like almost a year and a half ago. So 2021 was a really difficult year for me. Um, I did a lot of personal work, development work to kind of get my foundation under me. But I remember it was, it was probably April of 21. Um, 
and I, I went out for a walk and it started raining and I got, I was kind of upset and because I'm like, I just wanted to go on a walk. And so like, I remember I came back home and I wrote down just like, why am I upset about it raining? I was able to get outside and do this thing for me. And I remember writing down in my journal, when did we get scared of the rain? I just kind of let that sit for a while. But then a, a couple months ago in August, I went on a walk and like I had intention, like, you know what, I need to get on a walk, get out of work, do this thing. And I started walking and then it just started raining. This like complete downpour. And I just started laughing because I'm just like, it, I had this perfect moment in my brain about the idea of like, Hey, I'm going to go on a walk and it's going to be good for me. And then this rain happens. It's like, I don't, why is this happening? And I just started embracing the fact that like this imperfected, imperfect moment is perfect. And so like, I really started embracing the idea of this, like, let's go have fun again in the rain. Like at some point we got scared of the rain and this applies to like a lot of different other things that I can tail into a bit, but like when we're kids, when we're, when we're young, we're having fun, we're being playful. Like we're jumping around in puddles. We're having fun. We don't care if our clothes get wet. Mom's going to do laundry. We, we get to play in the rain. We don't run around in the mud. Yeah. Cool. Whatever. Maybe we have to take our shoes off when we get into the house. That's awesome. Good to do. But also like we were playful and fun. And at some point in time, we got scared of the rain. We got scared of getting wet because it, it meant that like something else came up. It's just like embrace that, that imperfect, imperfect moment so that we can have more perfect moments. And the fact that like, but yeah, let's run around in the rain. Let's, let's stop being scared of it. And it's the same thing I see with kindness all the time too. When kids are young, they're running around, they're giving each other hugs in kindergarten and preschool, and they're being happy and playful and just running around. Or if a kid pushes another kid down, the teacher, an adult, somebody steps and say, hey, we don't do that. We, we, we show kindness. We don't push other people around, like help them up, say you're sorry, go jump in, jump in the puddle, like whatever it needs to be. But eventually at some point we get to the point where Usually at high school, middle school age, we know bullying becomes a thing. It's a little bit harder for the teachers to step in and say like, hey, we don't do that. And eventually it gets to the point where it's almost commonplace for that bullying, that teasing to show up. And then when you show kindness, when you do random acts, mm -hmm. unprovoked acts of kindness to let people know what you mean to them and how they show up in your life, it's, it's unexpected because at some point in time, we forgot that kindness was a superpower. Mm. And with, there's all these superhero movies all the time you know iron man with all of his money flying around in a suit captain america like yeah but we forgot about like the one the one superpower every single human has is kindness and we forget to show it on a daily basis because at some point in time it's the same thing we got scared of the rain we got scared of jumping outside we got scared of showing love and kindness for other people and we really need to like give back to that more let people know what they mean to you like it's not a bad thing life is too short for us not to go around telling people what they mean to us like i've been to enough funerals where i didn't get to tell the people what they meant to me and i'm tired and i don't want to go to another one without saying hey joe i appreciate you you know taking time out of your day you can spend your wednesday mornings with me we have wonderful conversations and it lights up the rest of my week and the rest of my day Thank you for that. Like going out to other people, other members who just, you know, make our life better, write little notes, do what you need to do. Like let people feel loved and that kindness, enjoy the rain, jump in a couple puddles, have fun. Stop being so serious. I, I think we could probably just end the podcast there. Um, that, that is all really, really great stuff. And I know, you know, Zach, our conversations are between us, but uh, if it's okay with you, if not, I'll edit this out, but I want to highlight you for a second because your birthday was very recent. And, uh, you told me that for your birthday, you were planning on giving out birthday cards to the people who meant the most to you, thanking them and letting them know how much they meant to you. And I thought that was one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Something that has never crossed my mind. And I'm the guy who sends the the nice random text. I'm a guy who sends a letter every now and then a handwritten letter I had never thought of giving people cards on my birthday. Where did that come from for you? Yeah. So um, my junior year of college um, is actually this, this whole thing. It's, it's a long story, but my junior year of college, um, my friend Taylor Jordan um, and then her really good friend, Blakely Ehlers. Um, I got really close with both of them. Um, they became legitimately like big sisters to me. Amazing, amazing people. 
Um, and just like the point I was at in life in college, I didn't have a lot of friends, but like I always had those two I could go to. So both of them were a year older than me. So for graduate graduation, I wrote them, you know, a handwritten card, thanking them for like everything they gave me for the year. And, you know, I, I did that not for them, not for me, just because, you know, they deserve to know the impact they've had in my life. So I gave them that. We stayed in contact, you know, after they graduated a little bit here and there, we still talk on occasion. Um, and then when I graduated college, I wrote, you know, my friends letters because I'm just like, I'm not sure if I'm going to see you again. So this is me taking time to say, hey, thank you for these last four years, two years, however long it was, I know things we did together, um, what it was, what was important. And I did that. I'm just like, here, thank you. This is, this is me, you know, telling you what you mean to me. And, and I'm grateful for that. So like I did that. And then when I graduated law school, I did the same thing with a couple friends. And then um, lately that has devolved into now. It's just like, you know, give me a random Tuesday. I'm going to write a letter to, you know, I wrote a letter to Alex a couple months ago. I wrote another friend to my friend, Elena. Like I do these other things because like I, those people in my life that mean a ton to me and they might not know what their impact in my life has meant. So I'm going to let them know because I, I don't know what they're going through. Maybe they've had a really, really rough week. And that little letter, a handwritten letter on the back of a thing that I drew, maybe just brightens their day and allows them to positively impact someone's life down the road. Mm. And I want to be able to give that a little bit more. And especially like the past, like 16 months, past year and a half of just like some really difficult times. It was just like me diving into the fact that like, yeah, I want to celebrate my birthday with all these people. But I also want to let these people know what they mean to me. And this is why I get it, why I'm hanging out with them. Yeah. Half of them knew each other more or less tangentially stuff like that but like they all knew me and they all were people who have impacted my life on ways that I can barely even touch and just like I want them to know that it's like yeah it's my birthday you get to celebrate with me thank you and here's also a bunch of nice things I could say about you because we don't do that enough so I'm going to do that every single day until I got nothing left in me and then do it a little bit more Um, I, I hope that anybody listening to this just takes a second to think about who they can send a letter to a card to a text to just to reach out and let that person or those people in their lives know how much they mean to them and uh not to backtrack but i think this is kind of a maybe a way to interject some humor into a serious topic but also it's 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 important you know i've heard and i don't know if this is true that walking in the rain and running in the rain if you're going the same distance uh you get the same amount of wet and I'm not entirely positive if that's true, right? Zach's laughing, but hear me out. If you walk slow, right, the rain is obviously hitting you for a longer period of time. But if you run fast, then your your cross section of your body is catching more raindrops as you move through them. And so my takeaway, whether that's true or not, is you might as well just walk in the rain and soak it all in because you're going to get wet either way, right? Yeah, I like that. You're going to get wet, so might as well soak it in. Like the worst thing that happens is you get wet. <laughs> I think we have a t-shirt on our hand, Zach. You're going to get wet either way, so you might as well soak it in. Yeah. You could, you could get make one of those uh, Project Endure shirts that like when you sweat, like that's <laughs> the, the, the phrase that comes up. I don't know. People people uh, listening to this cannot see my facial expression, but that's, that is an amazing idea. Uh, keep an eye out for those Project Endure shirts. Um, so Zach, let's get into, into the deep stuff. So the question that I want to lead with is, what is the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle in life? Uh, in other words, a circumstance that you didn't get to choose for yourself. Yeah. Um, I think like last fall, I think like fall of 2021 was the hardest year of my life. Like 2021 was a difficult year, but like the fall made things just hard. So, um, this time last year, I just found out I failed the bar exam for the second time in two years. It's just like, cool. Um, and then there was this other opportunities in my life. I was putting myself out there for jobs, everything like that. And I just rejection after rejection, after rejection, I was living by myself. I felt just alone and lost and just like in a community I used, I felt like I used to have no, was no longer there. So I felt alone. I felt legitimately like a random drop of water thrown out into the ocean. Just like, yeah, go find me. Good luck. Like I felt like completely upside down in the abyss, like 
left was up down was right it was just like spinning around a million miles a minute it's just like cool and then I've always dealt with anxiety and depression but it was usually in waves and I think that was the first time in my life it was a period of time it was just like six weeks minimum and then like after that it was like the waves and then it was like another like four weeks it was just like that combined with the fact that like last the rugby season was just mentally draining on me like I was one of our team captains we did not have a good season and like we just kept fighting and fighting and fighting but like you know end of the day you're just defeated you're like we got scored on again we're down again like we we, we put together great plays and then we nothing to show for it it's just like that combined with the fact that like everything else in my life and I felt like I didn't have anyone to talk to about it like I had my therapist which was great but like I felt like there was so much going on in my life that I couldn't even talk about all of that stuff it was just like yeah here's some stuff but that's not all of it because like I don't even know where to start with all of it so it was just like me really taking ownership um starting really in December and January of just like cool I've been through that stuff yeah but I've also like made it through things I've, I've pushed through. I've, I found, found a spark back in my soul. And I think that was the biggest thing is like 2021 was the time when I found like that spark back in my soul of like me as a kid. And like you mentioned at the top with like me being an intentional carrying all of those other, you know, kind accolades that I'm probably going to save and just keep as a voice memo on my phone in the future, but understanding the fact that like, yeah, that's, that's me. That, that's who I've always been since I was five when you strip away the fact that like, since I was seven, I wanted to be a professional athlete. When you strip away the fact that like, I got ridiculously close. Yeah. I injured my shoulder. And then I spiraled through a different depression with a loss of identity of like, who am I once I'm not a rugby player and I started playing again. So I, I found it again, but the identity was different because I was like, now I'm just doing this for fun and I'm pretty good at it. But it's just like that, that end push wasn't the same way, but it's like last fall was just like, I know there's this part of me, I got to scrape back a little bit more. Like I kept, like covering up and giving myself reasons like no we don't we don't show that and then I really started being intentional with the fact that like if I open up about my struggles there's going to be somebody else out there who's going through something similar I don't, don't need to know what it is they, they might feel like they're drowning I don't care if they're in the Pacific Ocean or if it's two inches of water drowning is drowning I don't want people to drown so if I can share and I can be open I can be vulnerable someone can latch onto that and be like okay cool I can get through too and then you build that little bit of momentum. You be intentional about it. You let people know what they mean to you. And then I started doing all those things and my life got better. I started getting you know those opportunities I wanted. I started showing up fully. I felt more confident walking into the spaces that my smile came back. Like all these other things. I'm just like, cool, we're on. Let's do something ridiculous. Let, let, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep pushing because... Yeah, I know what it what it's like to go through it alone. And then I, I had friends, you know, support me through stuff like that, but like they didn't know the full extent of everything. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I was apathetic towards life. Like I didn't want to die, but man, the thing I was doing was not living. Like it was, it was hard. So I like I really realized once I like own myself, find the places where I could fully show up, find that community, find that support, things got better. And it's like I've got I can create the same thing for other people. If I'm open, if I'm vulnerable, if I'm real, someone's going to resonate with that. And if it, it's just one person, then it's one person and that that's enough. And then that eventually that has a snowball effect, but that one person, if I can fight through and be like, Hey, look, I've been through this. I had no control over, it, but I decided I was going to fight back. You can too. I got you. I will hold your hand. I will go into that, that tunnel of darkness with you, whatever you need. I got you because I'm not going to see you fall. Mm. first of all thank you for sharing that second of all a lot of that resonates with me and uh, a specific season of life that i went through and third i want to throw out a quote and get some thoughts this is from m scott peck who said we cannot be a source of strength unless we nurture our own strength i believe that not only do self-love and love of others go hand in hand but they are ultimately indistinguishable And I think in your scenario, and again, in my story, that decision to open up, to be vulnerable, it's uncomfortable, it's hard, it's scary, but it starts to build this momentum where we realize not only is that good for us, 
but hopefully it's good for others. And we can start to move closer to other people who are struggling with things behind closed doors. And to be honest, I would venture to guess that at some point in everybody's life who's listening to this podcast, we will feel down, dark, maybe depressed, however you want to label it. And that's part of being human. And I think one of the most important things you said there was the word community. And so I'm curious for you what it looks like to build community now. And what are the things that you keep in mind as you strive to build community for others who might be going through challenging things? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing with community is just like letting people fully be human, like their their full expression of their humanity. There's the, to trade some quotes with you, I'm pretty sure um, there's the Marianne Williamson quote of our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. I'll skip the first half because it does, <laughs> doesn't matter. But your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others people permission to do the same. As we were liberated from our own field, our presence automatically liberates others. And it's just, I think it's just a beautiful quote about the fact that like when we fully show up as ourselves, we're letting other people fully show up as themselves. If you want to have a dance party at 937 in the morning in your apartment, in your shorts, go for it. Do that. Post that on Instagram. Embrace it. Have fun. Smile. Laugh. Be a child again. Run out in the rain. Jump in a puddle. Do those things. When you do that stuff, you get one out of the mundanity of this just life itself, but two, you're creative, you're fun, you're, and you're, you're doing things again. I think the biggest thing is like, I have two buckets in life. I have my fun bucket and my chore bucket. I don't like chore bucket. So I try to put everything into the fun bucket because if I'm having fun, that's when I get better at something. If, if it feels like a chore, if I'm just doing a drill for the sake of doing a drill, it's just as good as taking out the trash. I got good as a rugby player, not because I worked really hard. Yeah, I did. But two, I had a bunch of fun doing it. And it, it was my own focus that got me there, that my own drive and determination. It didn't feel like a chore. It was a fun thing to do. It was a creative thing to do. It was an expression. And I think when we create community, when we create spaces, we want that community, that space to be someplace like if we were struggling, where we'd want to be and we'd be able to be, feel safe and seen in. And we want to feel seen and heard and respected and and loved. And you know, there's the Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's like you need your food, you need your shelter, you need your other stuff, and then you need community. But the thing is, um, no one has ever like killed themselves because they didn't have food. They might have died of starvation, but they didn't kill themselves because they didn't have food. They they kill themselves because they don't feel like a sense of belonging. They don't feel like a connection to people. And I think for so long in my own life, I was seeking that connection and that belonging and, and that want to be part of something else. And I had it in spaces, you know, I had it with my college teammates. I had it in others, just spaces and phases of my life, but then I lost it and I didn't know how to rebuild it and create it. So I sought out the places where people were fully vibrantly human. And I'm just like, that's where I want to be. So like my whole thing now is like, I'm going to have a bunch of fun. I'm a part-time fitness coach. And I'm pretty sure I have no idea what I'm doing, but I do know I have fun in every class I coach and everyone else is having a good time. And, you know, you can work out at any gym you want, but if you choose to go to a specific gym, you're going for the, the reason of the gym, you're going for the community, you're going for the, for the embedded principles behind the gym. Like, you know, I want to help people feel alive so that they can pursue hard things inside and outside of, of athletic areas. Cause I think that's awesome. Like go hike Mount Kilimanjaro do whatever you want. If you take in a class with me helps you get there. Awesome. But if you're having fun, we're doing a great job. Oh man. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that none of us have any idea what we're doing. Just, uh, just to chime on that. Yeah. And we're all figuring it out, but you know, a lot of things you said there resonated with me. And uh, I'm curious for you, Zach, you know, when you think of building community, I would also say the concept of a circle, an inner circle or a close circle probably can go hand in hand with that. And maybe it's different from community in some ways at large, but a circle is important. How do you build your circle? Because I know we've both come from places where we felt very alone, like maybe there weren't people around us who understood us. How do you go about building that inner circle? Yeah, um, there's the one quote. I had it written down, actually, in preparation for this. <laughs> Let me 
I love uh, it. Yeah. Um, you're, you're the average of all the people you spend yourself around, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like, so it's like, who do I want to be? And then, okay. It, and the people I'm hanging out with and, and the people I'm spending time with a reflection of that, or are they a reflection of very small portion of that? And that's okay too. They don't need to be a reflection of all of it, but like, I know with the people I spend the most amount of my time with the people I talk to the most, they are inspiring. They're motivating. They are, um, there are people that, you know, help me want to be a better person. Mm. I'm just like, that's what I want to be. I want that chase. I want to feel full from having these conversations. I don't want to feel beat down from having a conversation because I just had a conversation with someone. I celebrated something I just did. And their response was to celebrate something they just did. I was like, I will celebrate you, but I want to celebrate me right now. Like th- this isn't about you. I don't want the competition. I don't want the like, Oh, Hey, I did you know, if you did the 250 pound bench press, I'm going to, I'll hype you up every day of the week. But like, if I'm celebrating my 225 bench press, you don't need to celebrate your 250 bench press. You don't need to make me feel small because you want to celebrate you. And I think I spent so much time in like the competitions and the sports of this, like, well, I ran this time of time. I got this high jump. I got, it's like, awesome. I'm proud of you. I I, could, I, say, I don't think I could articulate it at the time when I was younger, but like at the time now looking back and like, yeah, I am proud of you. But like, I have my things that I'm focusing on. We're different athletic builds. We're different players. Like that doesn't mean all of our metrics need to be the same. And I think the biggest thing for me is it's like looking at people who just want to celebrate me and cheer me on day in, day out, who, who want the support, who are appreciative, appreciative of the kindness and the generosity and just, buying into that and being being ready for that next step i think yeah i think it's an important thing to understand that that community is a reflection of you and eventually at some point you grow out of different communities you move on you they ebb they flow they change and recognizing that understanding that is important but also you got to understand that like the people you are spending your most amount of time with are going to be well, one yourself. So make sure that's a good relationship. And two, like, are they reflective of what you want to be? And like, I had to change my community, I had to change the people I was spending time with, because at some point they became, they didn't become that. And that's a really isolating thing to do. It's really scary to do, but there are people out there who want to see you thrive and really search for that and just be really intentional with like what you're looking for be intentional with your time and how you spend time with people. Like if people aren't respectful of it, like you don't need to go out of your way to be too respectful of them. Like you can kind of like, not to like be like, well, you're rude to me. I'll be rude to you. You don't need that. But maybe it's just like recognizing that, like, I don't want to portray that in my life. Mm. I would also say that in my experience, many people, can reach out and uh, and support you when things aren't going well. Like that's one thing. When things are going well and people reach out to celebrate you, those are the people to pay attention to. When people can celebrate with you in the good times and not just reach out during the bad times, those are the people to pay attention to. And you know, to your point earlier, Zach, I think community really does help us do hard things, push ourselves, expand our limits, grow if it's built with intention. And I'll lead that into the next question, which is a simple one, but what's the hardest thing you've ever done on purpose and why have you done that thing? Um, yeah. So I willingly um, have done uh, four hours of burpees <laughs> twice to see how many I could do um, willingly. Um, just like, I'm going to go do four hours of burpees. And just like the, the whole idea behind it is um, I'm currently actually it's kind of on hiatus that right right now, but I wanted to train and break the 24 hour world record of burpees. Um, so that, that's, that's a goal of mine. I want to just see if I can, because one, I love burpees Two, let's have some fun. And three, like, why not, why not me? But the idea is just like, it's four hours straight of burpees. Nobody likes burpees except for me because my brain is broken. But the idea that says like, I, I'm going to do this. And this is like, I, I got, I was in the gym by myself music. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. I'll contact people in four hours. I don't have anything else going on. Like I'm, I just went in and I did it. And it's just like, it's the weird thing of this. Like, yeah, I, I tried a little bit before and I did a couple hours sprints. I did some two hour sprints, stuff like that. But it was just like, I got in, I did four hours. I'm like, okay, 
cool. I could go a little bit more. And it's just like, there's always that little bit in your head that says like, I can push the limit a little bit. And I think that's so, you learn so much about yourself when you're just like, let's do something a little bit tough and let's figure out like where that limit is. And instead of approaching the situation of what if I fail, it's like, no, nah, what if I like succeed and I, I create something bigger than myself? It's like, or it's what if I fail, but like I did this thing still. I can say that I showed up 100% effort and I can, I, I can say I did it. And I think that's such a powerful thing. I would say, you know what? I fully showed up. I didn't come in half-assed thinking I was going to fail. I, you know, I knew fully well, it was a possibility that I might, but you know what? I wasn't focused on that because I fully showed up with the focus and the intention aligned in the right, in the right space. I'm just like, for me, I think that it was a big mindset shift of like, yeah, I can show up. And if I fail, I, I learn something from it. I gain something from it. It's not a loss. It's, I think we get so caught up in society now of, well, if you failed at something, therefore you need to quit or you need to not do it. When, you know, back to being children again, as a kid, you suck at most things that you try. That's just the nature of being a kid. You don't have any skill, but you slowly learn to get better at it. And eventually the skills that you develop in that thing is able to meet the challenge that you want it want to do but eventually as your skill sets gets better you have to you have to move that challenge a little bit higher you got to challenge yourself some more and you get better and better and better you don't just as a kid you're like oh i'm going to draw something and you didn't make the mona lisa so you quit no you're like you're a kid i'm going to draw something this is fun and this is enjoyable i'm going to keep doing this and build this skill out because you're a seven-year-old kid and you want to be a seven-year-old kid mm. All right, Jack, I've got a couple questions. First and foremost, do you know the number of burpees in 24 hours that is cur the current okay. world record? 9,116. So it looks like this summer, someone broke that record. So we've got a new bar for you. Oh, boy. So 10,856. By... Is this the chest to ground or is this the... Ooh, that's a good question. So his name is Joe Riverdes. Um, let's see if this is chest to ground. It is Guinness world records. Uh, and it's hard to tell at a quick glance. So we'll have to fact check this. Anybody listening can fact check, but Joe, if you're listening, Zach's coming for you, Zach, for you, when you think of this record, is there a timeline attached to it? Or is this just something you're going to continuously work toward until you get it? I think it's going to like, I think the timeline is like, I want to show up and like, when I do it, like say that I fully showed up. If I, if I get it great, if I don't get it great, I want to be able to say that I fully showed up and just like for 24 hours, I did a really hard thing. Yeah. Cool. Like you get the record, you don't get the record, like raise a bunch of money for mental health awareness for men, like an advocacy, like cool. Do something that's bigger than me. Like that, that's why you do these things. You don't do it for you. I stopped doing this stuff for me a long time ago. Cause like, it's about the people who support me and have helped me help, help me get there. Mm. Yeah. The other thing I'll say is that whenever it comes to a goal or an outcome or something we are striving for, right. That 24 hours worth of burpees in this scenario, um, that is the icing on the cake, right? There's training, there's hours of sweat, maybe some tears, hopefully not too much blood, that all goes into this one quote unquote outcome and whether or not the outcome is met or not met, that's not really the point. The point is the process. It's about the journey. The work is the reward, who we become throughout that process, what we learn throughout that process, the people we touch throughout that process. And I think that's really easy to say. It's a lot harder to articulate and embrace maybe in those moments where the outcome is not being met. Um, but I really do think it's all about the work. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that as well. Well, I think, I think that's true. I think like, you know, I think half the battle is uh, showing up and the other half is doing the little things. Right. So it's just like, you know, when you show up, like, I think the perfect example is like, you want, I want to get in shape. So, you know, the first step it takes to get in shape is to show up at the gym. And then the next step it takes to show up the, to get in shape is to show up again. And the little things that you're doing right day in, day out, the consistency, the little things of like making sure your form is right, making sure you get the proper nutrition, hydration, stuff like that. That's how you get in shape. It's not because you're lifting 500 pounds and running two miles every day or whatever it may be. It's because you're making the continual effort 
to do this thing in the pursuit of the long-term goal. And then once you get there, it's the same thing with like the skill and challenge I was just talking about. Like your challenge is now you can take on a bigger challenge because you've built the skill because you're now in shape. So maybe you decide that, you know what, I want to see if I can do a thousand pushups in a row, or I want to see how many pushups I can do in an hour, whatever it may be. Just you challenge yourself, you push yourself because it's like, why not? What do I have to lose? I've lost myself so many times, like getting here, getting to like this point in my life. And it's like, I have nothing else to lose. It's just now it's just me fully showing up. And if I don't fully show up, that's when I lost something. And I don't want to do that again. Yeah, well said. I've got a, I've got a Mark Twain quote that I'll throw out here. He said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, right? 20 years from now, are we really going to care if we didn't break the burpee world record or we did break the burpee world record? You know, probably not. Um, but will we care that we showed up intentionally, fully, authentically every single day in, in everything that we did? Yeah, that's going to matter a whole lot more in 20 years, especially because that compounds with time. If we show up that way every single day, authentically, intentionally, and as the best version of ourselves, that's going to compound and create one heck of a person 20 years from now who's going to impact people along the way and at that time. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Like you can think you have, a, you want to win a Super Bowl, cool, whatever it is, but you're not, but you're going to be able to do the things that get you there. That impact is going to have a bigger impact than the achievement itself. And like, might as well make the, the journey fun, enjoyable, like part of something bigger than yourself. Like we don't do these things in isolation. I think that's the, the thing we, we forget about as society. We, it's a different point entirely, but like we live in such a connected society now, social media, TV, Netflix, all these other things. We're so connected. We're so intertwined with each other, but yet we're so disconnected from each other as individual people. So we need to do the things to bring us back to people, do the things for the people that mean the most to us in life and show up and you want know to say, dedicate that first hour of the thing you're doing to, to the friend that means the most to you dedicate something, be part of something bigger than yourselves. And we're not, we're not here just to do things in isolation. We're here to do things because of the, the people in our lives that make it better. So let's start celebrating that a little bit more. Let's build, let's build something. Yeah. And just to tie the concept of community and the concept of doing hard things. For me, I think back to high school football and uh, we won a lot of games. We lost a lot of games. We had a lot of fun. We did some hard things. But the moments that I remember, and especially the moments where I remember feeling closest to my teammates, were not after we won the big game or you know when we had a great practice. It was running sprints in 90 degree heat in the middle of the summer Someone's throwing up next to you. You can barely catch your breath and you're in it together. And that shared suffering really builds deep connections and bonds. And uh, I think it just, it emphasizes or highlights the importance of doing hard things with people that you care about, striving toward common goals. Uh, and that's really the reason why I created Project Endure and uh, why the Hard Things Club exists. And I can talk about that forever, but I think I'll just leave it there. And do you have any thoughts, Zach? I think it's, uh, you bring up like that, that community doing, doing things in with these groups. Like you see this with, uh, with individual athletes as well. Like yeah, you might be a, a track superstar, but you're training with a team because you can't do that by yourself. There, there is something about humans as we're, how we're designed, how our brain works, how our psychology works. Like we are not individual creatures. We're not lone wolves. We are we are social creatures. Humans are social creatures. And we've gotten so caught up with like, oh, you're an introvert or you're an extrovert or X, Y, Z, or you're an omnivore, which is a made up term anyways. But we got so caught up with that idea that we forgot about the fact that like, yeah, we still need people. Like I'm, I'm ridiculously introverted. I still need my people to help me because like when I'm with those people, those specific people, they're going to help me show up in other phases of my life. And sometimes those phases of life aren't even seen to the public eye. Maybe it's me at night writing or drawing or doing something else. But like, because I was able to have that, those connections and those conversations with other people for that connection and for that, that greater moment, like I was able to 
create something a little bit bigger and bolder. And I think that's, it's, we need that shared, like, yeah, we've been through this thing together. Mm -hmm. We can overcome that. We can overcome this next thing because we got each other. Like, I think about like, me being just a, a huge history nerd, like the Greek phalanxes, they weren't Greek armies weren't very big, but they were really strong because of the way that they, they worked in tandem as units. They were able to link their shields together to create very strong barricades that very, very, very few opposing armies could get themselves through that ph phalanx was strong because it was, you know, the greater, the sum of the parts, if you can be a great individual, but if you're not a great team player, are you really benefiting? Or can you get two great team players who are average to aggressively average at best mm. and you put them together on the same team and th their game becomes like the next Michael Jordan? I'll take those two guys every single day of the week. It's an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And uh, this podcast is about going far. It's about endurance. And so, Zach, when you hear the word endurance, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I think uh, endurance is is doing that thing and you keep that drive going because your internal motivation um, outweighs the, 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 in, the external noise that you see. And it's also that consistent resiliency thing I kind of talked about earlier. It's just like half the battle is showing up, the other half is, you know, doing the little things, right? It's you every day you show up because you have you have that internal drive you keep showing up you keep pushing you you know you take the time you you care about people you you do those little things you you show up you make people feel big and alive and warm i think we often forget that sometimes like endurance isn't like a like lifting heavy that's not endurance endurance is the fact that like you consistently lift heavy you're getting bigger, you're getting stronger, you're driving because you have that, that internal brain is just saying, Hey, this is the thing. And we're going forward and we're going to go through. Yeah. It might be hard. It might be really, really freaking hard, but we're going to keep going through because we believe in that end goal, that journey, that process and, and fighting for it. Oh man. I want to tie something you said earlier into what you just said. Now, when we are on that path of endurance and we're working towards something meaningful and it gets hard and we feel down and we're fighting those battles and we're not sure if we want to continue on. And then we get that letter from a friend who we hadn't heard from in a while. And then we get that text message and then we get that call, that belief, right? That encouragement, that love that just gets interjected into somebody's life can make all of the difference. And you never know when that's going to find somebody at a low point at a stopping point, at a point where they're contemplating whether or not it's worth it to continue on. I have one more quote from uh, Ken Porritt, who said, there is no greater power and support you can give someone than to look them in the eye and with conviction say, I believe in you. All right? It's that simple. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. The power of kindness. I talked about that earlier, that, that generosity to showing and be able to embrace the fact that like hey look i got i got you i got you if you fall i got you it's just like i think about you know the corner and you know i think about boxing a lot and it's like who's in your corner if you're a boxer and you look back you're bloody you're down you're knocked out you got to get back up and you need your you need your spark of motivation like who's in your corner that if you look at them you see that smile they look in your eyes like okay cool this is possible i remember in in march um I had, I, had, I wanted to get 30 burpees in a minute. That was a, that's been a goal of mine for like two years. And I finally got the workout. The workout ended with a minute of burpees. And right before that minute of burpees, there was like 30 seconds of rest. I was ready to go. Like my friend knew I was doing it. I look over, I look over at her. And I remember like that look in her eye. I was just like, yeah, you got this. Like, I remember I was like, okay, cool. Like my whole, my brain went blank. I was like, cool. I'm in my own little bubble right now for this next minute. I got, I got to hit 30 and I, and I hit and I did it. And it was the first time I was able to get that goal complete because, you know, I, I think a lot of it came from the fact that like, I looked at Elena and she's like, yeah, she didn't have to say a word. She, she didn't need to say anything. She, she just, yeah, I got you. I got you. I'm in your corner. I believe in you. Yeah. This is a dumb goal. It, I get that. But like, I still believe in the fact that you, you believe in this goal and, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's dumb or whatever else, but like you got this and I got your support. And 
when you're done with it, I'll be the first one there giving you a high five saying I'm proud of you. And I think that we forget about the fact that like, yeah, we need those people to just give you that little bit of push, that little bit of like support, that love, that generosity, that kindness of saying like, yeah, I believe in you. No one else needs to, but I do. That, that, that one person believing in you means a lot more than the thousand people doubting you. I've never thought of it in terms of a boxing corner. I love that. Just the imagery of, right? You get knocked down, there's blood, you're dizzy, you look over at your corner and you've got these people who you care so deeply about and they care so deeply about you. And it just gives you the strength to get back up. And how do you build that? And how do you build that with intention? And make sure not only are those people in your corner, but you're, you're in theirs as well. Um, I often will ask some of my clients who are runners, uh, you know, things get hard. It's mile 20 of the marathon. Uh, or you're near the end, but it's hurting and you want to stop. Whose faces can you see along the spectator route that would lift your spirits? Who are you running this race for? Who believes in you? And sometimes that's enough to give somebody the extra boost. And it's a similar concept, right? Like if everything is telling you to stop and you saw this one person or these few people, would you keep going? How do you find those people? How do you cultivate those relationships? It's so important. I think it, 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 that comes back to like that community, the people like, what do those people in your life um, mean to you? Um, before every rugby game, I would take my left wrist because my left wrist is like, does not function, especially like in, in, a, in a game, it wouldn't, but I would always tape it. And I would put up the initials of, you know, my friends and family that like, who are in my corner. And like, if I needed to like, look down and be like, okay, wh why we're down by 20? Why am I still doing that? Why have I not asked for a sub? Whatever it may be, I can look down and I just like open up that left wrist and okay, cool. I can just like zone in on two initials. Like there's, there's an AZ there. It's like, cool. Alex got me. Cool. I'm focused. I, I'm dialed in. Like, let's, let's make this, let's make this happen. Um, I, I also would say another parallel to running for anybody listening. If you have a race, if you have an event, right? Use that strategy. Like put some initials on your forearm, like throw, throw some names on your shoes, like whatever it takes, remind yourself that it's bigger than you and whether or not you give it your best and show up or not, it's not just affecting you. There are other people who this rides on. And I think that's, uh, that's pressure that sometimes can be hard to bear, right? When you know that your actions are bigger than yourself, but it's also extremely important because no matter how small and seemingly insignificant we are in this world, right? Just a drop in the ocean. There's billions and billions of us. We're at the same time, each unique, special, and very significant. And that, um, that, that, that dichotomy of you're so small and yet you're so significant is a really hard one to put into words. Um, but I would just say that life is so much bigger than us. And, and you said that so well, Zach. Um, and so with that being said, this is my favorite part of the podcast because we've, we've all had those times where we need somebody else to speak some uh, wisdom and encouragement into our lives. And so if somebody's listening to this podcast, Zach, you're in their ears right now and they're going through a tough season. They're not sure where to go or what to do. And they're just feeling stuck and frustrated and down and maybe alone what would you say to that person? I think the, the one thing I would say is like, I got you. I, I think that's the first thing. I think people need to know that they have the support system. Like it's, it's one thing I could be like, yeah, you're, you can get through this. I can do all the, like the fake cheerleading, empty praise. Like, you know, after I failed the bar exam, all my friends text me like, Oh, it, I, I'm sorry you failed. Um, you're going to get it next time. It's just like, this feels so empty. Like I, I, I legitimately was just like, this is not support. This is not, I want, I want a text message that feels like a warm hug. That, that, that's what I wanted at the time. And I was, I just got empty, empty apathy for the sake of empathy, empty empathy for the sake of empathy sake. Cause it made them feel good that they sent that message. Mm -hmm. And I want, I want, if someone's going through something rough, I want them to know like, Hey, I got you. What do you need from me? Do you want to grab a coffee? Do you want to grab something to drink? Do you want to grab something to eat? What, what do you need right now? So I can best support you. Because I believe in you and you are capable of great things because I've seen you do great things. Why can't we make this into another great thing that you do? You know, it's crazy. I know you said that to me through this, this podcast recording. 
but I know you also mean it for anybody who's listening. And uh, if anybody's listening and, and you feel maybe even just a, a, a twinge of, hey, I should reach out to Zach, just do it. Just do it. You will not regret it. Um, and I know Zach's there for for everybody. I am as well. Um, and Zach, just appreciate you, man. Do you have any closing words for the people? Um, yeah, I think like, you know, we kind of mentioned it, but like understanding like who do you play for? Like end of the day, like, yeah, you're the one who's on the field. You're the one who's running stuff like that. But like end of the day, there's a motivation. There's a drive for why you do something. Lock that in. Know who's in your corner when you look back up understand like that we all have immense value to give the world and do not lose that light and that spark inside your soul. Because if, if you don't, then we can light the world on fire with so much good, so much kindness, so much grace that the world is really starving for right now. So I think when you get down, when you feel like maybe you're not doing something, know that you've impacted more people than you believe, than you feel like you have. I guarantee each and every single person listening to this has impacted more people than they will ever know. Um, and just use that as that motivation to keep going. Like you don't need to impact a million people. You don't need to have 5 trillion social media followers. Like understand that like if you post something on social media, and, like 50 people like that, imagine if like 50 people came up to you and said that they were proud of you. How would that make you feel? One, you'd probably be like almost like embarrassed and like, be like, ah, what's going on? Like for me, like that's a lot of people. So like introverted me would be like, where's the closest hole? And I would like dive into it. But like also understanding the fact that like, people care and support about you in ways that they might not show. So you show them what they mean to you and maybe they will, they will tell you. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow, maybe down the line, just let people be loved and, and show them that light and then, you know, help light the world on fire, make it a better place, leave people better than you found them. Yeah. There couldn't be better words to end on there, Zach. And for anybody listening, if you enjoyed Zach's light tonight and you want to connect with him or get to know him or follow along with his journey, uh, Zach, where's the best place for people to do that? Uh, Instagram is the best place um, at zdonahue 7 And then there's a link there for my website for other contact is uh, zachdonahue.com. So those are the two big ones. And then, yeah, reach on out. Um, I'm, I'm an open book and yeah, that, that's really what I got. Yeah. So I want to see, I want to see people thrive. I want to see people find that spark in their soul and, and just like light, light it up. Zach, I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully express in words how much you mean to me and how much I appreciate you. Uh, but just know that it's, <laughs> it's a lot. And uh, I don't cry often on the podcast. I came close a few times tonight uh, and I, I kept it together for the sake of, of the voice quality. Uh, but I really do appreciate you, man. And uh, thank you for this. Well, thank you, Joe. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.